not one for sports, the story goes. His story, by the way. Uh, Stuart Smith's best times as a child was spent fishing in the canals in the east end of London. He arrived in New Zealand, age 15, in 1928, alone, and just with his brother Jack. In a scene reminiscent of Monty Python's Meaning of Life, Smith's parents couldn't afford to feed and clothe all their kids. So, uh, figuratively and literally, the two oldest lads were farmed off to the central North Island and kind of helped a domestic bliss in this London household and just down the road from West Ham Football Club. Smith's old man liked to gamble. Anyway, on arriving to his new country as a teen, it wasn't on the land Smith migrated to, it was the sea. In his teens and twenties, he earned a crust working in commercial fishing. It was on one of those trawlers at the back end of the Great Depression, Smith was introduced to communism. He would be enamoured with Marxism for the rest of his life. When the war broke out in 1939, Smith declared himself a conscientious objector and spent the next four years in Ha Tu prison and just outside Turangi. His objection to war wasn't necessary because he was a pacifist. He was simply afraid that if he joined one of the forces, he was going to be shot by his own troops when they found out he was a commie. At the end of the war, Smith shifted to Auckland, and to start with, he found his niche on the wharves. Around this time, he apparently observed children catching eels and lamented the lack of freshwater species in New Zealand compared to his homeland. The children of his adopted country deserved the opportunity to catch the coarse breeds of fish he had back in England. Koi, a carp, a trench, rudd, etc. The odd thing was, by this time, Smith himself wasn't that interested in recreational fishing himself. He had always considered trout fishing that required a license and payment to be the preserve of the upper classes. It didn't stop him fishing for trout in the river next to How To Prison, though. Throughout his entire life in New Zealand, Smith was totally obsessed with replicating his so-called idyllic lifestyle in London's East End. Which beggars the question, why didn't he simply go back if it was so bad here in New Zealand? Get used to Russia in winters, even. Embrace the wonders of communism in Bulgaria. Rather than accepting his environment and adapting to it, Smith set about to change it. By the late 50s, he was working his butt off running a Caltex petrol station in Massey, Auckland. Had the well-earned nickname Shotgun Smith. Calling intruders on his property and holding them at one stage at gunpoint. chasing them down the road, blasting away merrily. In the mid-sixties, a Celtics decided they wanted to develop the site and made Smith an offer he couldn't refuse. He could live on part of the remaining property and Caltex would pay him to rent the rest for the rest of his life. Now, in his early fifties, with no wife and kids, he could retire early and live on the income rental and do what he wanted. What he wanted meant systematically releasing banned coarse fish into local waterways. Smith kept meticulous records. Between 1964 and 87 alone, he was guilty of illegally releasing 13,000 coarse fish into North Island lakes, ponds, streams and rivers. A small sample of which are, or were, Western, Western Springs, Springs 64, 64, Lake of Pupuki, 69, Lake Rotuiti, 71, Spectacle Lake, 73, Riverhead, 78, East Tamaki, 87. He wasn't that particular. Starting with Rudd, he smuggled into New Zealand with a load of vegetables on board a cargo ship. The majority being bred and fed in specially built oxidisation tanks on his property. 
His release of Rudd and Perch into Lake Rotota wiped out the native population of E. Nunga within a decade. It's not as if Smith didn't know Rudd weren't good for the environment either. When he learnt about the decimation being caused by Rudd, his solution was to bring in Perch. Trout populations also dropped as larger fish began competing for the finite food source. Still, trout were for posh pricks who could afford a fishing licence. This was inevitable a part of the class war he believed in as a lifelong card-carrying member of the New Zealand Communist Party. A class war that was being played out in New Zealand's lakes and rivers. None of this sort of collateral damage concerned Smith in the slightest. He was proud and defiant, wrote gloatingly and openly to local papers, expecting kudos, which never came. To disguise his illegal activities and aid transportation to release sites, he even went to the trouble of decking out his vehicles with oxygenating tanks. Smuggled eggs on his person through customs and the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries. Eventually, he was prosecuted. The first time was in 1974, in which his vehicle, a larder, was seized. That clipped his wings for a few years. And the unremorseful Smith labelled the prosecution as fascist. Smith seems to have gotten the New Zealanders who did go off to war and fight fascism. He could have, for example, joined his comrades in the ruins of Stalingrad fighting the Nazis house to house. However, when the real opportunity came to fight fascism was there, Smith, as we know, wimped out. His enthusiasm to introduce species after species was never tempered. In 1988, he was again prosecuted. This cycle of cat and mouse continued. In 2005, now in his 90s, Doc, the Department of Conservation, raided his house and found he had a 10,000 infant gudgeon in a tank awaiting release. That's one on your screen. What's more, there were also an Australian crayfish called Smooth Marin. And these were only discovered when an escaped marin was found by a boy scuttling about the gutters near Smith's property. You won't find marin in the Thames River, that's for sure. Remember, Smith wanted the world to believe and painted a picture. He simply wanted children to enjoy a fishing in lakes and streams to have free access to fish stock. In the next breath, he didn't see it as a problem using gelignite to catch fish on board the trawlers he crewed and nor did he care about dumping a crayfish into the midst, knowingly creating one problem and solving it by creating another. Deluded and pig-headed, somehow believed his enterprise would result in New Zealanders digging up their back lawns en masse and replacing them with ponds to go fishing after work, stocked with coarse fish, naturally. Beggar's belief he had, and still has, his supporters. The loony left and anarchist who loved how he put two fingers up to the evil government of the day. Then there's also elements within the coarse fishing community who saw and still see him as a rebel with a cause. Even if that cause was irreparable damage to New Zealand's freshwater ecosystems, the lifelong bachelor died at 95 in 2008. He put his inability to find a partner in New Zealand down to his pommy accent. Are you sure that was the only reason, Stu? Even today, a Smith's right of entitlement extends from beyond the grave. When his property was sold, the funds went into a trust. That trust still donates money to North Island coarse fishing clubs even today who turn a blind eye to the messy and awkward eco-terrorism business that went on. When your father sent you away on a one-way ticket all those years ago, I really wish he could have picked another country. That's because the moment you stepped into this country, Joseph Stuart Smith, 
you became New Zealand's most noxious introduced pest. Bye for now.